Abuelo was a guardian of the door of Mazzalantli. He held the key to the door and was tasked with protecting it from the scourge of the mycoids, fungal creatures with only one purpose. Consume all and expand everywhere. Abuelo died fighting the mycoids in the city of Tapazilio, only to have his poncho discovered by Quintorius Cond shortly after he was done wrecking the pioneer format. Khand resurrected Abuelo as an echo. Abuelo later accompanied Imperial soldiers through the door he once guarded. Unfortunately, opening the door to the core of Ixalan allowed the Myco Tyrant, a mycoid who had assimilated several other exploring pirates and had become incredibly intelligent, to make its way through the door into the core that Abuelo was supposed to be guarding. He would fend off the mycoid menace once again, until another pirate, Breaches, would finally help him destroy the fungus for good. So that was a very brief overview of the story of Abuelo Ancestral Echo. I think a lot of Commander players don't realize that every single one of these creatures, for the most part, has some story or lore significance in Magic the Gathering. A lot of people just kind of treat them as the creatures that helm their decks and nothing more. So I figured I'd go ahead and give it a shot at, you know, kind of giving some of that story about those characters before talking about the deck. Though I know that most of y'all are here to talk about the deck specifically. That said, this deck is actually a suggestion from Marcane Themain, who said that he loves these budget decks and wanted to try... Uh, wanted me to try my hand at making a budget build of Abuelo. So here we are. Here is Abuelo, and his abilities are Flying and Ward 2, so it's very hard for people to get him off the board early game. And we can pay three mana to exile any creature or artifact we control and then pop it back onto the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. So I think it goes without saying we're going to be playing Abuelo as a Blink Commander. And what that means is we're going to be abusing several creatures who will be getting their ability when they come into the battlefield and we're just going to be blinking them over and over again in an effort to basically break their abilities over the, over our kneecaps so since this is a blink deck i think it's very important for us to first talk about our blink cards these are going to be the cards that we are going to be using to reset our battlefield over and over again on top of abuelo's ability we don't want to rely solely on our commander for that and there's a lot of interactions we can get with blink cards over and above what our commander would do so First of all, we have Momentary Blink, Exile a Creature we control, and then put it back onto the battlefield. This has Flashback, so we can use it again after we use it. Uh, Icewind Stalwart, when it comes onto the battlefield, we can Exile a Creature we control that's not a warrior, and then put it back onto the battlefield under our control. Restoration Angel, same thing, just it gets a non-angel and blinks it. It also has Flash. If you have the Restoration Angel and the Icewind Stalwart, by the way, they will blink infinitely with one another, so... If you build your deck with some type of ETB trigger off of that, then you can go infinite with that if you so choose. We also have Scroll Shift, exile any artifact or creature or enchantment we control, then put it back onto the battlefield, also gives us a draw. Flicker Wisp lets us exile any other permanent and then put it back onto the battlefield at the end of the end step. Planar Incision lets us blink an artifact or a creature. Turn to Mist lets us exile any creature at all and then return it to the battlefield on its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. This is an interesting card for us. If somebody steals one of our creatures, we'll be able to use this to get those cards back. We also can use this to take a problematic creature out of combat, so that's an option we have as well. We also have Displace, exile up to two creatures we control and then put them back onto the battlefield under our uh, under their owner's control so there's another way we can blink but this one will blink multiple cards speaking of multi-card blinks though we also have lazelle's acrobatics and semester's end both of these will let us exile all or you know as many of our creatures as we want in some cases creatures we control and then put them back onto the battlefield at the end of our turn lazelle's on the other hand though allows us to roll a die to figure out if we are going to be putting those onto the battlefield at our end step or putting those onto the battlefield once and then exiling them until our end step. So we either get our blink triggers immediately and then throw them away or we just dodge out from board wipes and dodge out from kill spells either way. 
Then we have Yurian the Sky Nomad. If you played in the modern format, then you already know how much of a pain in the butt this card is. But Yurian says that when it enters the battlefield, exile any other number of non-land permanents you control, and then put those cards onto the battlefield at the beginning of your next end step. So Yurian actually, if you have Yurian and a Restoration Angel, these two can just infinitely blink between each other each turn. So each turn cycle, you get a new set of your blink ETB triggers. This will give you a ton of value and will cause you to be the problem of your table for a very very long time so maybe it's a good idea to snipe one of these away if you're fighting against this deck but if you're playing this deck just remember that's an easy way that you're going to gain advantage speaking of advantage one of the primary ways we have to gain advantage in this deck is with a boatload of draw power. So let's very quickly go over that. We have Priest of Ancient Lore. It lets us draw a card and gain a life when it comes into the battlefield. Cloud Blazer, we gain two life and draw two cards when it comes into the battlefield. Circuit Mender gains us two life and then draws us a card when it leaves the battlefield. Elite Guard Mage gains us three life and draws us a card when it enters the battlefield. Icker Wellspring can draw us a card when it's put into the graveyard or when it's put onto the battlefield. Spirited Companion will draw us a carbon enters the battlefield watcher of tomorrow is really interesting it has hideaway when it comes onto the battlefield exile the top four cards of our library put one of them face down put the rest in the bottom of our library whenever this card leaves the battlefield we can just put that card right into our hand so this gives us four cards deep of card selection and because we're going to be blinking it so many times we will always have the ability to get that card and if the opponent tries to kill the watcher of tomorrow so that we don't get that ability any longer then we'll just get whatever he hit away the first time into our hands immediately so we really never lose with this guy. Mold Drifter, when it enters the battlefield, draw two cards. It also has Evoke, which is important. We can pay the Evoke cost, drop the, uh, the Mold Drifter onto the battlefield, and then just blink it back onto the battlefield, giving us an extra draw automatically. Um, we can also use Abuelo's ability to just blink it the minute it comes out. It'll cost one more mana than playing it normally, but it'll draw us four cards. Like, just... Mold Drifter's a good Magic the Gathering card. People don't play Mold Drifter enough anymore. Then we have Wall of Omens. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card. And the Ever-Flowing Well. When it enters the battlefield, mill two cards and then draw two cards. Also... If there are eight or more permanent cards in our graveyard, we can transform it into the Myriad Pools. Whenever we cast any permanent spell, any other permanent we have becomes a copy of that spell until end of turn. We're really not going to be using that backside all that often. Mostly, we just want to be able to go, hey, I have this ever-flowing well, and my Abuelo is going to blink it once, a, uh, you know, one to three times a turn cycle, drawing me lots of cards. I hope it's okay for me to gain an obscene amount of advantage from that. Uh, but speaking of advantage, uh, guys, I'm so sorry. I've built yet another deck where where dungeons are a part of it. I I can't I can't stop putting dungeons in decks. This is not my fault. This is this is your fault for letting me do this. Y'all are subscribing to the channel and enabling me. This is actually y'all's fault, not mine. But under Seller Sweep, when it enters the battlefield, we take the initiative. Also, if we attack uh, any player who has the initiative, so if somebody takes it from us, we can get two 1-1 one, one White Soldier tokens when we swing with it. Arakoa Sneak has Flying, and when it enters the battlefield, we take the initiative. Feyweld Caretaker, when it enters the battlefield, we take the initiative. Uh, if it's our end step and we have it, we get a 1-1 one, one Blue Fairy. And then the broken-ass Tomb of Horrors Adventurer, when it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, copy it if you've completed a dungeon. Copy that spell twice instead and then you can choose new targets for the copies so a really quick rundown of what the initiative is for those who might have forgotten it's basically a token that as soon as you activate uh you will hold on to the token for the initiative and you'll hold on to a separate token that's called the undercity if you get hit you'll lose the initiative just like if you had monarch but unlike Monarch, the initiative triggers at the beginning of your upkeep and not the end of your turn. Every time you gain the initiative or your upkeep begins while you have the initiative, then you will go one step further into the dungeon. So every time you blink one of the initiative creatures, you'll go further into the dungeon. The Undercity is a five-part dungeon, the final part of which allows us to look at the top ten cards of our deck and place a creature onto the battlefield for free with them. So we will be getting any of our high-cost creatures we're going to want later on of the game we're just going to cast them for free by breaking the initiative over and over and over and remember if we've got the mana to do so we can just keep blinking these initiative guys with abuelo we don't actually have to play any of our blink spells abuelo will just do it for us but speaking of big mana stuff how are we going to get to that big mana stuff well 
we also have to ramp there but because we're a blink deck we get access to some pretty broken styles of ramp so let's really quickly go over core cartographer when it enters the battlefield search your library for any planes card and put that into the battlefield tapped note that doesn't say basic planes we can get any kind of planes with this so if we have like irrigated farmland or anything like that that you know are not irrigated farmland it might be irrigated farm prairie stream there's the one uh if we have prairie stream we can actually just pull that out of the deck immediately even though that land is a dual land we do it doesn't matter for us also irrigated farmland is one of them i forgot all of these lands we can get and we'll talk about them when I, uh, we get to our land section but that's not the only way we have to get lands out of our deck. We also have the Scampering Surveyor. When it comes into the battlefield, search our library for a basic land or a cave and put it onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. So the Scampering Surveyor and the Core Cartographer, they're in this deck because they are blinkable. These come onto the board. They give us the ability to just immediately get a land out of the deck. And then every time we blink them with Abuelo, we're going to get another land out of our deck. If we are trying to sink mana, if we don't have plays to make and we're just sinking Abuelo's mana into these guys, we're going to thin our deck of all of its lands very, very, very quickly. And in so doing, we'll only have live cards in our deck and also have all the mana in the world to cast them. We also have Omen Hawker, a one mana, one, one that can tap to give you two mana that can only be used on activated abilities like Abuelo. Then we have the Marble Diamond, Sky Diamond uh, combo. These both give us access to blue and white mana for two mana. I love the diamond cycle. They are really, really good. Mind Stone, we can sack it to draw a card, which is going to be important because we have ways of getting the Mind Stone back. Command Sphere, same thing. We can sack it to draw a card while also being a ramp card. Uh, the honored heirloom is in here if you if you catch me building a deck without this in this challenge it's gonna be weird but the honored heirloom lets us have access to uh cucking people's graveyards on a mana rock it's great then we have wayfarer's bobble sack it get a uh, basic land from our library onto the battlefield and then we can just pull this card back with our reanimation spells i'll show you guys later and then we have Planner Atlas. Uh, it's a bit expensive, but it is one of my favorite uh, types of mana rock, and I wish that more people ran it. When the Planner Atlas enters the battlefield, uh, we can look at the top four cards of our library, take a land card from among them, and put that card into uh, the top of our library, and the rest go onto the bottom. So basically, if we open up the game with two lands and this, we can guarantee that we get our turn three land drop with the Planner Atlas, no matter what. It's just a nice, nice, uh, it's a nice, nice safety card. But of course, ramp and draw does not make us win the game. We also need to be able to clear out our opponent's creatures and their problematic cards to make sure that we can get in and win so in order to do that we're going to be relying on our removal package we're starting out with runaway boulder it is one of our 11 removal cards and this card is very very silly in abuelo let's take a look at it so the runaway boulder enters the battlefield and it deals six damage to any creature an opponent controls and because it's an artifact we can blink it with abuelo we're just going to drop this on the board blow up a creature and it's not a good rate of return the first time but then every single time we get to pay three mana to deal six damage to another creature over and over and over it's just gravy and then of course we have meteor golem enters the battlefield blow up any non-land permanent and opponent controls War Priest of Thune, ETB, Destroy an Enchantment. We also have Negate to protect our board. It's just the, it's the one token counter spell we're going to be running. We're just going to counter any non-creature spell. And then we have the Space Marine Devastator. When it enters the battlefield, blow up any artifact or enchantment. We can also squad two so that we can replicate this card a bunch of times when it comes out. Most of the time, though, we're just going to drop it down and start blinking it. Duplicate, uh, when it enters the battlefield, exile a creature an opponent controls. The rest of the text ain't too relevant. Spine of Ishash, destroy any permanent at all when it enters the battlefield. If it ever touches the graveyard, we get to put it back to our hands. We're going to get this card down, and we're just going to blink it with Abuelo over and over again to guarantee that we are blowing up all kinds of problematic cards. Oblivion Ring, when it enters the battlefield, exile another non-land permanent. When it leaves the battlefield, return that card to its opponent's control. However, what we're going to be doing with O-Ring is we're going to be casting it on a card, and then before it goes to its second trigger, we're just going to be exiling it with Abuelo. That gets us rid of any card the O-Ring touches, and they don't get the card back because Abuelo, and o uh, Abuelo can thread his effect into O-Ring that quickly. Also, our other blink spells can thread into it, but the fact that our commander can do it is just nutty. We also have uh, Kutzel's Flanker. 
when it ETBs, we can either scry to and gain to, or we can exile a person's graveyard. I have said it before, and I'll say it again. You should be a responsible Magic the Gathering player, and you should run ways to blow up graveyards. Reanimation players, uh, they cheat. I am a reanimation player. I cheat. Then we have the Sunblast Angel. This will destroy all tapped creatures when it enters the battlefield. So we're going to play this first to get rid of everything our opponents have that's tapped. And then anytime our opponents swing out at us, we're just going to threaten them by going, oh, those creatures look awfully tapped. I'm just going to play one of my blink spells and everything goes. Or I don't have any blink spells, but I can throw this card into exile with Abuelo and make it come back down as a crackback. You hit me for 20 damage, I blow up your board. It's only fair. And then we have Generous Gift. We can blow up any permanent, and then that controller will get a 3-3 Elephant. The most important part about this card is it blows up any permanent that our opponents have. We don't care what they have on the board. We're just going to go ahead and knock it out. Very, very important. Uh, it can also kill lands. So if somebody has a Glacial Chasm or a Maze's End, we're just going to turn that off. They're just going to turn that card right off. And then, of course, we have the reanimation and recursion packages of the deck, and they are not super dense, but they are still very, very important. So let's quickly go over them. Against all odds, we'll blink any of our creatures or artifacts, and then it can return an artifact with mana value three or less from the graveyard to the battlefield. So like our command sphere or our mind stones, so we get easy draws with them. Then we have Karmic Guide, uh, enters the battlefield, return any creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, and then it has an echo effect that we're never going to pay for because we're just going to be blinking it each time. Storm of Souls, any of our creatures that are in the graveyard, we just get them all onto the battlefield at once, uh, and then they become 1-1 spirits with flying in addition to their other types, and then we exile the storm. So all of our creatures with good ETBs, this is just going to throw them all onto the battlefield all at the same time, and it will just help us win the game. Not quite on the spot, because we don't have haste in our colors, but it will basically threaten everybody all at once. Then we have Sun Titan when it ETBs, get it a permanent karma band of value 3 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. That can be <clears throat> the command spheres of the Mind Stones. That can also be any of our creatures that have died. And then we have Revelark. When it leaves the battlefield, take two creatures with power two or less from our graveyard and put them onto the war battlefield. So every time we blink this with Abuelo, we're just going to get a lot of revives with it. And then, one of the cards we can revive with it, just so you know, is the last part in our uh, reanimation and recursion package, Archeomancer. When it enters the battlefield, return any Ezra sorcery from our graveyard to our hand. So here's a fun thing we get to do with this. Play the Archeomancer, get back, like, Lazelle's Acrobatics, and then play Lazelle's Acrobatics, putting it in the graveyard, throwing our entire field away from board wipes and stuff. And then with the Archeomancer, we just get Lazelle's Acrobatics back. It's a nutty play, and we can do it over and over again to frustrate our opponents. If you've never played with the uh, Obnoxious Blink player at your table, it's time for you to be the Obnoxious Blink player at your table. But if you are a Blink player, you do need to try to win the game. Now, nothing that we've shown so far helps us win the game. So how are we going to be doing that? Well, the very first thing we're going to be using is called Knight Paladin. When it enters the battlefield, deal four damage to every opponent. So just with Abuelo, we can put this card onto the battlefield, and then... Everybody burns, and then we can use Abuelo to blink it three times a turn cycle. And this will generate four times four. This will generate 16 damage every turn cycle. We blink it three times on the first turn cycle, four times on every subsequent turn cycle. And this will just guarantee that no matter what the board state, we can make sure that everybody is burning to death very, very quickly. Night Paladin is a silly uh, kill card that we have access to. And remember, if you have any of your regular blink cards, you could just blink it with those too. If it, even, if it says that it only blinks a creature, just use one of the tokens we're going to be making with the next set of cards and crew it with that to make it a creature, and now it's blinkable. Like, did this card is silly good. It's very, very strong. And there's a vehicles deck I'm going to be showing you guys in a few uh, in a few weeks with Mishra that's going to be cloning Knight's Paladin a bunch of times. But that's a project for later. Next, we have Blessed Sanctuary. Prevent any non-combat damage that would be dealt to me or creatures I control. And then any of our non-token creatures, if they enter the battlefield from blinking or anything, we make a 2-2 white unicorn. We're going to be blinking our creatures a lot, so lots of unicorns are coming out. Threefold Thunder Hulk when it comes into the battlefield. Put three counters on it, and then whenever it attacks, create a 1-1 colorless gnome uh, with power... Or amount of gnomes equal to its power. But here's the thing. 
its power is only ever going to be three, basically, because we're just going to be blinking this over and over again, creating an army of little gnomes. This thing will never actually swing. It will just make all the gnomes. Then Renar, the Ever Watchful, every time we exile one or more cards from our hand or permanents from the battlefield, we make a 1-1 one, one white st uh, spirit creature token with flying. And then we have Renar. It's got flying and vigilance. And every time we exile one or more cards from our hand or permanence from the battlefield, we make a 1-1 one, one spirit creature token. So just by doing the thing our deck wants to do, he will be passively making us tokens along with the Blessed Sanctuary. Then the Mirror Battle Sphere. This one's nifty. Every time it comes into the battlefield, make four 1-1 one, one colorless mirror tokens. And then whenever it attacks, we can tap any of those to give it plus X plus O and then burn somebody for X damage. Uh, and X is just, you know, the amount of mirrors that we had. So we're going to be bringing this out, and we're going to be blinking it as many times as we can to make an army of murs. And then instead of swinging with the army of murs, we're just going to swing at one person with the battle sphere, tap the murs, and burn them for their entire life total. It's going to be great. And then we have the Whirler Rogue. Every time we ETBs, create two Thopter creature tokens. We can also tap those tokens to make a creature unblockable. So like the Mur battle sphere can become unblockable because of the Whirler Rogue. Finally, the last few pieces we're going to use to make sure that our deck curves out well. Mycosynth Wellspring, when it ETBs, we get a land from our deck into our hand, a basic land, uh, and we can just blink this card to get more land so we never actually miss a land drop. Then the Angel of the Ruins, we can plane cycle it for any of our dual lands or planes. And if it is on the battlefield, we exile two artifacts or enchantments. Uh, basically, we're just going to get rid of the ones our opponents control. We're never going to touch ours with it. But... If we have this in the grave, then we get it back with something like Karmic Guide. If we have it in our hand and we have the mana to cast it because of the obscene ramp this deck is going to do, then we're just going to start making sure that our opponents never get to have strategies on the board for any amount of time. Speaking of getting rid of strategies on their board, we also have Omdu Inversion, a lovely land that doubles as a board wipe for all non-land permanents. Remember, it's super easy for us to blink our entire board away before casting something like this. So this really isn't, it isn't asymmetrical, but it feels asymmetrical. Then Cleansing Nova can blow up all creatures or all artifacts or enchantments. We can just make sure that we will never be hurt by this when we do it. And then we have the funny section. We have the area where our blink payoffs are. The Diluvian Primordial, when it enters the battlefield, we can take an instant or sorcery from every opponent's graveyard and cast it for free. This card will win us games on its own because we can just drop this on the board, get our free casts, and then start blinking it over and over again with Abuelo every single turn to make sure that we get th three free spells, or I guess a spell for each one mana we spend into it uh, each and every turn. Not counting our actual blink cards. Diluvian Primordial's nutty. And then we have the Paragene Drake. When it enters the battlefield, we get to untap five lands. Every time we blink it, we get to untap those lands as well. So, what we can use this for <clears throat> is if we have only a handful of lands available for Abuelo to use its effect, then we can blink the Paragon Drake to make sure that we have access to more lands going forward. Uh, this card has like a bunch of infinite combos that you can build into it if you so choose. It's just a nice blink target we can use to extend our combos if you're not wanting to go infinite with it. But uh, just so you know, if you do play the Drake, uh, it's very likely that somebody is going to see it and then target you at the table. So it is up to you if you want to put this uh, this lightning rod in your deck. I'm not telling you to run it. I'm telling you that it's in this build and it's a reasonable card to play. But now we need to go to the basis of how all decks run the land section. We're running 10 basic islands, 15 basic plains. We have four fetchable lands in Glacial Flood, uh, Floodplain, Idyllic Beachfront, Prairie Stream, and Irrigated Farmland. We have four fetching lands in Promising Vein, Shire Terrace, Esper Panorama, and Bant Panorama. And then we have a dual land and an Omni land. Port Town comes into the battlefield, reveal a land from our hand, make it stay untapped, and then command tower it can tap for any color uh that our commander has as a color identity so it can tap for azorius for us and that is it for abuelo he is a very very run-of-the-mill blink commander i'd say actually 
If you are new to the game and you want a commander that will give you a lot of advantage and make sure that you don't run out of resources while you're playing, because there's nothing that feels worse to a new Magic player than running out of cards and just watching everybody else play the game. If you want a commander that will make sure that you are always in the driver's seat of your deck, Abuelo's a really good way to do that. He can protect all of the cards on your board with his exile ability. He protects himself with Ward 2. He can blink all of your stuff to make sure you gain tons of advantage. And all in all, he's just a really cool commander. I'm glad this guy came out. I actually didn't know that he was a thing until he was mentioned by that comment because we have so much magic product that comes out these days. So I had no idea he was even a thing. I haven't seen anybody play him yet. I guess when they think Azorius Blink, they'd rather play like Brago or something, but he's perfectly serviceable as his own commander. So give him a shot. And if you want to build him as well yourself, let me know what builds you end up doing. And if you end up building this version of Abuelo, then hey, let me know in the comment section below. That said, if you have any other suggestions, both for this deck and for future decks for me to cover, then please let me know in the comment section below. Hopefully y'all enjoyed this one. The final cost of the deck came out to $15.17. So just... Five cents over $15, well within a margin for error for that deck. And the markets, as cards come in and out of the market, that will affect those prices. The deck will float in, in and out. So if you have suggestions for me, let me know in the comment section below. But as always, everybody, I have been thoroughly enjoying this project of mine and i've been enjoying having you i've been enjoying growing this channel honestly and seeing you guys just come in and give me positive feedback on it, it feels great my throat is ravaged i normally do these videos in one take and i'm sitting here staring at a bunch of pieces in the editing reel so i guess i've got a lot more work to do now than normal uh, i should probably not record these while sick Anyway, as always, everybody, thank you for watching. Hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and insert end of video tagline here. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability a Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. They would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Nabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamotto, Jordan, Ravi, Giuni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you, Sagitta, I'm not saying that part, and Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.